I want to do here is, uh, as the title would suggest, present an argument for God's existence that I'm willing to guess most of you haven't really heard before. This video was given to me specifically by people claiming the stuff my alter ego used in the Aquinas video was all straw man, and this is the one I should really watch. And apparently, this is designed specifically for atheists, so let's go! And I wish to offer a specific argument that actually demonstrates the logical necessity for this ultimate reality as classically conceived. By the way, this is seven minutes into his video. He spends seven minutes basically whining that all atheists have responded to his straw man versions, even though he admits that we get them directly from people like William Lane Craig. And then he spends another three minutes whining that people don't understand metaphysics. This is not a good sign. Before we dive into the argument for God's existence, in order to make sense of the argument's conclusion, we need first to go over a metaphysical principle that underlies the fabric of the argument. And that is the distinction between potentiality and actuality, or act and potency, to use the traditional jargon. And it takes him another two minutes to actually get to it. My god, this guy rambles. But Zeno would argue the contrary. For an order for the hare to catch up to the tortoise, he would have to traverse half the distance uh, between him and the tortoise. But in order to, for half that distance to be traversed, the hare would have to traverse half that distance. But in order to traverse half that distance, the hare would have to traverse halfway yet again. Since the distance is infinitely quantitative in this respect, it is impossible for the hare to move at all. Hence, even local motion is impossible. In reply to the obvious objection of, well, but I see it, they would just respond, well, who are you going to believe? You're reason or your feeble senses. This is bound to strike any person of sound mind as absurd, but declaring it absurd does not really get at why it is absurd. Not really sure what Zeno's paradox has to do with this, but it's worth discussing. It's a paradox because it's absurd, and yet it appears logical. This guy has completely missed the whole point of logical paradoxes like this. The first step in wisdom is to realize that you're confused. Because if you're presented with something like Zeno's paradox, which appears logical and yet reaches an absurd conclusion, then you're supposed to realize that you're confused. And from that, come to the realization that something you believe is wrong. It took until the 20th century for science to resolve the paradox, which is that the assumption that distance is infinitely quantitative is wrong. Quantum mechanics tells us that there is a smallest possible distance, the Planck length. It's impossible for something to move half a Planck. Therefore, the hare doesn't have to travel through an infinite number of points to reach the tortoise. They didn't know that in Zeno's time, and so Zeno had no way of knowing that it was that particular assumption which was wrong. But the awareness of being confused lets you become aware of what you don't know, and so the process of discovery can begin. But when you have something like God that you can just stick in as a placeholder, you interrupt that process. It doesn't give you any new information. It doesn't allow you to make any new predictions about the nature of reality. But it feels like an explanation, and so you fail to realize that you're confused. And the entire process of discovery is then cut off. Something that can explain anything, in reality, explains nothing. For if the rational proof is sound yet yeah, untrue, then it would mean that reason itself is inherently defective, which demolishes logic altogether and even science. No, it means there's something we don't yet know about the nature of reality. In this case, it's quantum nature, which allows us to realize that our assumption of infinitely divisible distances was incorrect. And over the next few minutes of this guy's rambling, you can see that this is exactly the kind of thing he is avoiding. He is moving from one irrelevant example to another, that of leaves changing colors, which again, we now know why that happens, and it's all done to distract himself from the major errors he's making in his reasoning. He doesn't realize that he's confused, and therefore, he's completely incapable of gaining any new knowledge in this area. The supremacist one. Essences, which is just to say, individual things that are intelligible as distinct objects exist. Premise 2. If each essence is not the same as its existence, then those essences are contingent. Premise 3. If all essences are contingent and considered in themselves, they do not exist. Premise 4. Just refer back to premise 1. And conclusion. Therefore, there is that whose essence and existence is indistinguishable, uh, such that it is subsistent existence itself. And to this, we give the name God. So, let's go through it. 
by essence, we simply mean what something is. No law of identity. Things are just themselves. A equals A. There are many trees, for example, but they are all definitionally united as to their common nature. Well, no. They're all different kinds of trees, but trees is a category humans made to group them together. It's not even an evolutionary category. Things we call trees often have separate different origins, giving them different taxonomies. Hardwoods have a different evolutionary origin from evergreens, and even a lot of evergreens have distinct origins from each other. Palm trees and banana trees are actually herbs. The bamboo tree is actually a kind of grass. There isn't actually a single concept of tree in nature. Humans just made that up. And see, this is the kind of thing I was talking about. If you want to know what the proper categories of things we call trees are, you need to study evolutionary biology. If you just assume that there's some worldly concept of tree that they all just belong to, you cut off that entire line of knowledge from you. And by the way, this is exactly the same kind of assumption I attacked in the previous video. Somehow I have a feeling we'll be seeing a lot more of this. This cannot coherently be denied without denying the obvious. It is clear that, there is, that there's a shared principle whereby trees share common unity. No, there isn't. Just human imagination and making them all fit some pattern that does not exist in nature. This is implied by the reality of change. For example, when hydrogen and oxygen combine to make water, this can only happen if the potential to generate water is real as prior to the actual gener generation of water, given the principle of potency and act. Thus, since the nature of water must be real as potentiality, it follows that there is a whatness to particular instantiations of water given the distinction between act and potency. Do you see what I mean when I say he doesn't realize he's confused? Hydrogen makes water when it's oxidized, we know that, just as iron makes rust when it's oxidized. You're talking about a chemical process to change one into the other. But you're trying to worm it into Aquinas' notion of potentiality, and thus you're distorting the definition of potential to the point where it becomes pretty meaningless. No matter what happens, you could say it happened because it had the potential to happen. But that means there isn't any possible observation you could ever make that would falsify this notion of potentiality. It explains everything, and therefore it explains nothing. We can then proceed to arguing that essences are really distinct from their existence. But as we've seen, these so-called essences, by your own description, are really just from human imagination. So what is the grounds for making this distinction? Well, that's quite easy, actually. I mean, you exist, right? Well, have you always existed? Of course not. Moreover, you could go out of existence at really any instant. I should say a madman break into your house and kill you. Even here and now, though, the internal homeostasis of your biological makeup is a conditional for your very existence. And if that were to utterly fail, then you would just cease to exist. Furthermore, it is possible to conceive of what something is without necessarily conceding that it exists. We can, for example, conceive of the essence of a dinosaur, without being committed to the proposition that dinosaurs still exist. While conceiving of a dinosaur as a single, cellu single cellular organism, for example, would be to misconceive of a dinosaur, even if dinosaurs don't exist anymore, it would not be to misconceive of what a dinosaur is if we were to exclude its existence. While in actuality, the existence of the dinosaur and the essence of the dinosaur are not actually separable in reality, they are nevertheless really distinct from one another. Ah, oh, do you see what I mean about how this guy rambles? And that rambling means he's unable to see where he's confused. He has a concept of dinosaur as extinct species that don't exist anymore. Except, when scientists went and studied what it actually meant to be a dinosaur in terms of evolutionary clades and not mere human imagination, they found out that this assumption is wrong. Dinosaurs are still around because birds are a kind of dinosaur. This is the kind of discovery that opens up when you study the actual relationships of things in the real world, and it's exactly that kind of study that he's completely closed himself off to. All because he has things defined so he doesn't have to see how confused he is. Even on pure logical analysis, though, the real distinction between essence and existence, and at least all but one reality, must be conceded. For if we were to conceive of an essence in which essence and existence were not distinct, then there could only be one such reality. This is because if an essence and its existence were not distinct, 
then they would only be able to be identical. I don't even think he understands what he's arguing here. We've established that this essence he's talking about is just human categorization. Even when it's something fairly objective like dinosaur, it breaks down because all that's really happening in nature is animals having babies that are slightly different from them. There isn't really a point where you can specify that dinosaurs became birds because no matter where you pointed to, you'd still have parents and children that were almost identical. Nature is just changing and flowing. Humans are making the categories. These things he calls essence just don't exist in reality. But we can't stop here. For if what something is and that it is are not the same, then how can anything be said to exist at all? In other words, if existence is not included in the essence of what things are, such as you or me or a tree or a rock, then considered in themselves they have no existence and cannot even in principle. For existence is not implied by any thing that differs from its act of existence. How, then how, so how does essence and existence coincide in anything whose essence is distinct from its existence then? Well, we know one thing. Uh, existence would have to be imparted to such essences from without. Do you see the sleight of hand he's committing here? When magicians want to make you think they've made a coin disappear, they use misdirection. They behave as if one thing is happening and use it to cover what's really happening. So when they appear to move a coin from one hand to the other, they go through the motions of it in a way that disguises the fact that they just kept the coin in the original hand. So when they open up the other hand and reveal it to be empty, it makes it seem as if the coin has disappeared. All of this pseudo-logical rambling is there to misdirect you, and likely even himself, from realizing that he's got the order of things wrong. Things in the universe don't have this essence, they just are. Essence is the meaning we impart to them as human beings. The existence of a thing leads to the perception of its essence. There's no essence that leads to its existence. The universe has no concept of dinosaur. That's just the things chemicals do in a certain environment given enough time. What's going on isn't anything more than the laws of physics just working. Humans looked at some of the products of those processes and gave them a name. Dinosaurs. There was no essence of dinosaur that existed at the time of the Big Bang to make them happen. That concept only exists in the human mind. Therefore, existence could only be imparted to an essence which is distinct from its existence from something else. Again, he's got this completely the wrong way around. But if that uh, is also such that its essence and existence are distinct, then it too would require a cause outside of itself. So all of this is a long-winded 20-minute way of establishing causality. But as we'll see, like with so many other things we've talked about, causality just isn't what he thinks it is. Now, if everything were like this, then it would follow that nothing could exist at all, even in principle. An infinite regress of such beings, such as this, does us no favors. Why not? This goes back to my complaint from the other video. What logical progression leads you to rule out the possibility of infinite regress? They always seem to skip this part. And keep in mind, I'm not talking about a regress in time, but here and now, hierarchically as it were. Doesn't matter! You're talking about something being the cause of something else. That makes it temporal. In order to cause something, there needs to be a moment in time where the thing you cause doesn't exist, and then you cause it, and then it exists. This hierarchy is more pseudo-intellectual sleight of hand, again so he can avoid realizing that he's confused. So questions of the temporal origin of the universe, etc., really have no bearing on this argument at all. You wish! An infinite regress such as this would be unintelligible. You mean it's unimaginable. You're only reaching this conclusion from your own incredulity. You have no way of ruling out either an infinite chain of causality or an infinite hierarchy of causes. That this follows is because if there are things which do not have existence in themselves, but receive it derivatively, like I derive my existence from my atomic structure and from the sun, etc., then nothing could exist at all, even in principle since you'd have an infinite regress of derivative existence, which is a logical absurdity in itself. You haven't shown that. Hence, we must come to a reality that derives its existence from no other, and this can only be pure, subsistent existence itself. Otherwise, there would necessarily be a distinction between its essence and its existence, which would just push for a further extrinsic cause. Do you see how his confusion is leading to him not even being able to explain this intelligibly? Note again that this is not an argument for the beginning of the universe, as previously said, 
the universe could be past eternal and it would bear zero relevancy to the soundness of the argument. Why? Because you say so? If it did turn out that the universe always existed ad infinitum, then what room would there be for anything to create it? Remember that to create something, there must be a moment in time where it didn't exist, and then you create it, and then it exists. If the universe always existed, it cannot have been created by something else. The conclusion of this argument um, is, is, is one and the same with what St. Thomas Aquinas uh, refers to as, as God. And that's skipping over a bunch of steps. And that's without even getting into what we know about the Big Bang, not the least of which is the time itself formed in the Big Bang. And so there wasn't any time before the Big Bang, and since creation is a causative function, the universe could not have been created because there wasn't a time when there was no universe so that the Creator could have created it. You also don't have this hierarchy he keeps spewing on about. This is nothing more than pseudo-intellectual sleight of hand to get around the inherent temporal issues. We know from the Big Bang that the universe formed from the bottom up, not from the top down. From elementary particles making bigger and bigger structures until you get the universe we see today. And it's really the, the heart of what's meant by God in the classical theistic tradition. God is an all-powerful sapient being that created the universe. So where did he come from? How did he become all-powerful? How did he derive sapience? All you're doing is taking your very contrived unknowns and replacing them with something that just brings up a lot more questions. But if nothing created God, if he just existed, then why couldn't the same thing be said of the universe itself? It just saves you a step. Even if you did establish that the universe was caused by something else, that cause doesn't have to be God. There's a theory called loop quantum gravity that says our universe was caused by a previous universe that collapsed. Another theory, M-theory, posits that our universe was created by the collision of two membranes in 11-dimensional hyperspace. There are a ton of options here other than God. We're not shoehorning a preconceived notion into the conceptual meaning of subsistent existence itself. That is exactly what you're doing! You've just surrounded it by so much pseudo-logic that it's hard to see if you already have the conclusion in mind. For those of us who aren't operating from that preconceived notion, we can easily see the confusion, and therefore we can be led to other options. So it's no good to respond to this argument with, well, okay, but why would it be a god? Because for this argument, and for the classical arguments for God's existence like this, there's, we're not shoehorning a word that signifies anything other than the meaning that can intelligibly be derived solely from the conclusion of the argument. But it can't be derived from the conclusion of the argument! That's the point! You can't even show that the universe has a cause at all, much less that the cause is God! Thus the conclusion of the argument would be as follows. Uh, there must be that whose essence and existence are identical, such that it is subsistent existence itself, and to this we are giving the nominal label God. If there ever could be any such a thing in the universe, it's elementary particles. We know from the Casimir effect that particles can form out of the vacuum as a consequence of the uncertainty principle. In the early inflationary universe, these particles made a quantum foam that, once the universe reached a certain size, got to the point where they could form atoms. Here's the point. Not only have you not determined that the universe has a prime mover, you haven't determined that it has only one prime mover. Instead of one god by your definition, there could have been two, or seven, or fifty, or a million! And if there could have been a million prime movers, then each and every elementary particle could have been its own prime mover, just as quantum mechanics says. So then, under your definition, the universe has a hundred quinquavigantillion gods. That's quite a pantheon! Building those statues must be hell! Whereby the word god is just a nominal label being ascribed to the concept. So then you haven't proven the existence of god in any meaningful sense. You've just redefined it so that it can mean anything that we might discover playing such a role. In other words, it explains everything, and therefore it explains nothing. It can be proved, for example, that pure existence is omnipotent. Go ahead! This ought to be good! Well, omnipotence means the power to actuate anything logically possible. But if God is pure existence, existence itself, then his very essence would be that through which the power to do anything is possible in the first place. Since existence precedes any manner of existence. Existence precedes any manner of existence? So existence exists before it exists? Huh? And since subsistent existence itself is the first cause of anything other than 
subsistent existence itself, the causal powers that are possessed by all things other than subsistent existence itself must be derived from subsistent existence itself. Uh, maybe you ought to try redoing this video when you're sober. Given the principle of proportionate causality. And so the powers, or the power of subsistent existence itself must transcend the limitations of that, uh, of, of, of those things other than itself that are derived from it. Let me translate this for you. The prime mover would have to be like Laplace's demon. He would have to have the knowledge of the position and velocity of every single particle in the universe. This is the basis of causal determinism, which he is relying on whether he realizes it or not. The problem is, quantum mechanics shows us that this is impossible. It's not just that we can't know the position and velocity of a particular particle at any given time, it's that it doesn't really have a specific position and velocity. It can have one or the other, but not both, when it's observed, but then its position is wherever you observe it to be. Same with the velocity. The universe is probabilistic, not deterministic. You've also got limitations like the maximum entropy of the universe and the fact that information cannot travel faster than light, making such omnipotence impossible. And if you want to try to warm your way out of it by saying that God is in some alternate dimension or superior timeline, then if you try the math on that, you get all sorts of infinities that you have to deal with. Which means that you would have to posit the very sort of infinite regress you had to claim was impossible to get to this point. So let's return to that distinction between potentiality and actuality for a second. Do we have to? If a thing can only change by being reduced from potentiality to actuality... Again, there is no potentiality here. You have matter that's acted on by forces. Nothing more. It also stands to reason that the relation between essence and existence would be a relation of this type. And essence is just human imagination. For that reason, subsistent existence itself would also have to be purely perfect. First of all, why? You didn't actually establish that. And second, what does perfection even mean? All you're doing it is comparing it to some imaginary ideal that exists in your own head and nowhere else. For example, a triangle is more perfect as it approximates its nature. We don't really see a whole lot of triangles in nature. Nature tends to be way too fractal and chaotic for that. The closest things nature tends to make is spheres, although for many reasons it can never make a perfect sphere. So I guess an oblate spheroid is more perfect than a perfect sphere? I think we have another logical contradiction here, folks. What would a perfect triangle be anyway? Equilateral? Right isosceles? How would you even begin to define it? It can also be shown that God, pure existence itself, is absolutely simple, which is the bedrock of classical theism. Which is to say that subsistent existence itself can in no wise be composed of parts. Except it can and is. This is because if pure existence itself were composed of parts, then pure existence would receive existence derivatively, which is absurd. Why? Because you say so? Because you're completely incapable of comprehending emergent complexity? Then you're going to have a problem not only with quantum mechanics, but with biological evolution and even economics. When multiple different sciences tell you that you're wrong, there's no way around it. You're just wrong! It cannot be denied that what can demonstrably be ascribed of God, by that would just mean that which is subsistent existence itself, in this sense is at least related to will and humans. It not only can be denied, I'm denying it right now! And this relation is not merely metaphorical. And if there was will, there must also be intellect. Uh, now, a standalone argument for the intellectuality of subsistent existence itself is the fact that, as the first causal principle of all things other than itself, uh, given the fact that a cause cannot of itself produce what it, is, what it does not have, given the principle of proportionate causality, the abstract element to the created essence is triangularity, say, as distinct from particular triangles, or humanity, as distinct from Socrates or Aristotle, must have its source in that which is subsistent existence itself. I think Samuel Beckett must have had this guy in mind when he wrote Lucky's monologue in Waiting for Gatto. And so, subsistent existence itself would have to be the wellspring from which all universals, which are the formal elements of particulars, uh, it would have to be the wellspring from which they're grounded. He hasn't said anything that hasn't already been debunked. He hasn't shown that there is a wellspring, or that there's only one wellspring. So next would be omniscience. Now, uh, this one should be fairly easy, since if God is pure actuality, as the metaphysical ground of all things, that are actual and potential, since potentiality is necessarily grounded in actuality, um, and since we can also predicate intellect of God, 
then it would follow that uh, God knows all things actual and potential, precisely in the act of causing all things other than himself. We have the same problem here as I've already mentioned with Laplace's demon. Finally, can we predicate love of God, by which I mean subsistent existence itself? Well, I think we can, assuming the word love is clarified and qualified. By love, we do not mean some emotional affection, but we mean willing the good of the other. Goodness is also a concept of man that doesn't exist integral to the universe. In Thomistic philosophy, goodness is ultimately the same as being, uh, but from the standpoint of the will. Thus, good is being as sought after by the will. Thus, it is good to be healthy, because health conduces more to perfection, uh, which is determined by actuality since a thing is more actual the degree to which it conforms to its nature. Completely circular reasoning. His nature is arbitrarily defined by your imagination, and so things like health and goodness are completely arbitrary by your description. Again, none of these concepts are fundamental to nature. In nature, things aren't perfect or imperfect. They just are. Therefore, since God wills the existence of all things, uh, as was shown, then it follows that insofar as he wills the existence of all things, he wills their perfection. Everyone does see how completely circular this is, right? I don't have to keep explaining it. So, no, one last thing I want to cover, though. Oh my god, will this guy never shut up? Is, how can it be said that God has all these attributes if it was also demonstrated that God, subsistent existence itself, must also be simple and composed of absolutely no parts? Well, remember how we deduced those uh, attributes. We deduced them from one simple principle, that is, subsistent existence itself. Thus, when we predicate various attributes of God, it must be said that each- Oh, knock it off! Here's his argument. In order for God to create the universe, he must be simple and not made of anything else. And yet he also needs to be omnipotent, omnipresent, and full of whatever the frick this guy was calling love. I'm still not completely clear on that. But God is just like white light. It's just one simple thing, and yet a prism can make it all sorts of different colors. So really, God is one thing, because prisms, or something. And you thought explanations of the Trinity were contrived. So, study Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas and scholastic disciples. Yeah, and you might also want to study things people have written within the last 700 years. Amazing, isn't it, how these people think that all of philosophy just stopped around that time? Hey, thanks for watching! Please hit like and subscribe and keep these videos coming by donating, becoming a subscriber and getting special benefits, or even for free with airtime. And check out all the great content here, like this video selected just for you!